Do sometimes you guys get confused when I talk about the 19th century and you start thinking the 1900s? It's a common thing. Just remember, when I say the 19th century, I mean the 1800s, right? When you say the 20th century, you mean the 1900s. At the beginning of the 19th century, Protestant Christianity barely existed outside of Europe and North America. In Asia, Asia was almost untouched, except for a few Christian traces in India and Indonesia. Africa was considered the dark continent and had no Christians virtually, except a few Copts in Egypt and Ethiopia. Yet, at the end of the 19th century, Christianity had radically spread all over the world. I like what Kenneth Scott Latourette said, one of my favorite church historians. He said, never had any other set of ideas, religious or secular, been propagated over so wide an area by so many professional agents maintained by the unconstrained donations of so many millions of individuals. In other words, what he means by unconstrained donations is he means the voluntary gifts. The 19th century was a remarkable century of Christian advance and missionary movement throughout the world. Kenneth Scott Latourette wrote many wonderful works on church history. Um, his two-volume History of Christianity is one of the best I can recommend to you. It's a lot of pages. Between the two, pages, between the two volumes, it's something like 1,500 or 2,000 pages, but it's a great read. I highly recommend it to you. His um, multi-volume series on Christianity in a Revolutionary Age is also good. But one of his seminal works is a multi-volume set called The History of the Expansion of Christianity. He has one volume on the first 500 years. He has a very small volume on the expansion during uh, uh, the Christian Empire period. He has another small volume on the expansion during the Reformation period. He has three separate volumes just on the 19th century. Because 19th century saw an explosion of missionary effort all over the world. Now, some people say that the first missions movement was the Reformation itself, and that the mission field was Central and Western Europe. However, it's clear that many groups before the Reformation had some kind of evangelistic zeal. The Valdenses, the Lollards, even Francis of Assisi went to Egypt to preach to the Muslim king. Roman Catholics were busy spreading their faith around the world, while Protestants had virtually no missions work. One big reason for this was because the most successful seafaring nations in the world, basically Spain and Portugal, were both decidedly Roman Catholic. It also helped that Roman Catholicism had monastic orders within it that were kind of a ready-made missionary force. In other words, all up and down the coast of California, you have a series of missions started by Father Junipero Serra of the Roman Catholic Church, who was a monk, and from his monastic order, he went out as a missionary to advance Roman Catholicism in these areas where Roman Catholic explorers and governments had colonized. Luther himself was not much of a missionary. Actually, Luther felt that Jesus was coming so soon that there wasn't much sense in putting forth a long-term strategy of missions. Luther also honestly felt that the Great Commission of Matthew chapter 28 was actually just given to the Twelve Apostles, not to the Church in general. Many Calvinists, especially in the early centuries, tended to be fatalistic about missions and evangelism, mostly because of their doctrine of election. Their thinking was that if God had truly chosen some among the heathen world, then they would find their own way to salvation. If God had not chosen them, then there really wasn't anything that man could do. Yet it must be admitted that Calvin himself had a strong missionary interest. 
From Geneva, he sent forth dozens of missionaries back to his native France, but he also commissioned four missionaries to go with a group of French colonists and establish a colony in Brazil in order to evangelize the natives. The venture began in 1555, but it ended tragically when one in the group defected to the Portuguese, who then robbed and killed the French colonists. But as early as the year 1550, King Gustav Vasa, the king of Sweden, sent a missionary to Lapland. His successor, Gustav Adolphus, that great general who died in the Thirty Years' War, he also planned a missionary work from the kingdom of Sweden. Calvin, as I said before, hoped to promote gospel work in Brazil. The Quakers in the 17th century had an interest in missions. In 1661, George Fox, who was a Quaker leader, commissioned three missionaries to go to China, but they never made it to their destination. Now, Roman Catholic missions began in earnest before Protestant missions, and they took it upon themselves very seriously to propagate their faith, and they did it broadly across the world. They went to China, they went to India, they went to the New World, both Southern and North America. They did a lot of the hard work of the advancing of the Christian gospel, albeit in a Roman Catholic form. After the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, it marked an end to a very ugly era, the end of the serious religious wars that had plagued Europe. The end of these wars helped the Europeans to prosper and colonize many other parts of the world. It's interesting that colonial development, the colonizing of the rest of the world, did not begin in earnest until after these religious wars were ended in Europe. The evangelical revivals during the 18th and 19th centuries also combined with European imperialist expansion opened up vast new areas to the Christian message. Now you could say that the beginning of Protestant missions began with a group of people known as the Moravians in what is today Eastern Germany. They were the first church to undertake foreign missions. The real breakthrough really started a little bit further back than the Moravians with a group of German Pietists, but it sort of started in Denmark. King Ferdinand IV of Denmark was a Pietist himself, and he appealed to Augustus Franke, a pietistic leader who, as a university professor, had turned the University of Halle into a major center of training and education for the pietistic movement. Let's remind ourselves, the pietistic movement was a movement within Lutheranism. And within Lutheranism, the pietists wanted to give back to a more heartfelt faith, a more faith of experience, and a more of a faith focused not so much on doctrine and argument about doctrine, but a faith more focused on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, at the time that Augustus Franke and the people at University of Halle were turning into sort of like a pietistic university and center of influence, at that time, almost no one thought about foreign missions at all. And the German pietists following Franke were commonly ridiculed. They were called enthusiasts, they were called priests of Baal, they were called heretics and false Lutherans and dangerous people. These were the people that the king of Denmark sent to for help in evangelizing people in his own overseas lands. Two men volunteered to go to Trankabar on the southeast coast of India. A man named Bartholomew Ziegenbach and Henry Plutschow. This was the beginning of what became known as the Danish Halle Mission. And in the following decade, starting about 1714, a missionary college was started in Copenhagen that trained missionary recruits, including a man named Hans Egede, who established a missionary colony in Greenland in 1722. In 1721, the Danish king provided financial support for an expedition under this Norwegian priest to go to Greenland and to convert the Greenland Vikings to Christianity. However, they didn't know that the Viking settlements on Greenland had disappeared a few hundred years before because of some very severe winters. 
Therefore, Hans Egede turned his missionary attention to the native population, and he established a Scandinavian colony there. Egede was an uh, educator, an author, a natural historian, a cartographer, and an addition to his missionary work. Soon after, he returned back to Copenhagen in, 13, excuse me, in 1737. He drew a map of Greenland, which is the oldest surviving map of Greenland that was drawn by an inhabitant. Now, this contributed in small ways to the Moravian movement that started about 1700. It started under the influence of a man named Nicholas Ludwig Count von Zinzendorf. His father was a high government official in Saxony, but his father died when Zinzendorf was only six weeks old. He was brought up by his mother, who was a friend of Jacob Spenner and a follower of Pietism. When he was only ten years old, Zinzendorf was sent to Augustus Franke's grammar school at Halle, and he and other five other Christian boys were deeply impacted by the spiritual and pietistic environment. They founded a club that they called the Order of the Grain of Mustard Seed, and they pledged themselves to love the whole human family and to spread the gospel. Then he went on to study law at the universities of Wittenberg and Utrecht. In 1719, on a grand tour of Europe, he saw a painting in an art gallery in Dusseldorf. It was Domenico Fetti's painting titled Ehe Homo, showing Christ wearing a crown of thorns, and its inscription on the painting read this. It said, All this I have done for you, what are you doing for me? Right then, Zinzendorf decided to leave his job of government service and live his life for full-time Christian service. In 1722, he arranged the settlement of a group of Moravian refugees on his land at Bertelsdorf. In 1727, there was a unique outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the group at Herenburg. We'll talk about that more in our lecture this evening. Zinzendorf emerged as the leader of this spirit-filled group of Moravians, and he traveled extensively throughout the world, including England, Europe, North America, promoting their work. He ministered to Eskimo converts of a Danish work. He sent missionaries, therefore, to the Eskimos. When Zinzendorf returned home to Herrenhut, he inspired the Moravians to um, go out and do missions works around the world. Within 30 years, the Moravians had missions work in more than 10 different countries. One historian says this, their self-sacrifice, their love, and total commitment to evangelization are unparalleled in the history of missions. Despite the very small size of the group, the Moravians sent out hundreds of missionaries in the 1700s and inspired countless others to go. One historian has estimated that the Moravian missions achieved more in this period than the entire history of Protestant efforts before them. So the Moravians went all over the place. They went to the Virgin Islands, they went to Greenland, they went to North America, they went to Lapland, they went to South America, they went to Labrador. Now, Moravian missionaries were expected to be self-supported. They were expected to make a living for themselves in the places where they went. For example, in South America, the Moravians established a variety of businesses, including tailoring, watchmaking, baking, and so on. Their economic and spiritual influence grew, and a thriving Moravian church emerged in Suriname off the coast of South America. Now, Zinzendorf was an interesting character. He was a nobleman and an aristocrat. He used his prestige and his connections to advance the cause of the gospel, but it is also said that he was kind of an arrogant man and somewhat conceited. He definitely didn't live the life of a hardship-suffering missionary. And whenever he traveled, he expected to be put up in very nice quarters and treated like a nobleman. There was another group that saw themselves as very deliberate missionaries, and that would be the pilgrims in North America. The pilgrims who came to America saw themselves as deliberate missionaries. It's true that they also perceived themselves as being refugees, 
from political and spiritual persecution in their native England, but they even brought one man with them, Robert Cushman, whose specific job was to evangelize and to promote the conversion of the Indians. When the pilgrims were followed by others who formed the Massachusetts Bay Company in 1629, the company seal showed the figure of an Indian saying to the men of England, come over and help us. The idea was that come over to North America and do it as a missionary effort to help evangelize the native population. But as we come into the 19th century, these all were works that began before the 19th century. As we come into the 19th century, you have the formation of the Voluntary Missionary Society. This had a big impact on Christianity. And it began to take power and money away from the institutional churches and their missionary efforts and put it into interdenominational concerns for greater cooperation. By the way, these um, interdenominational, we might call them parachurch missions organizations, gave much more leadership to laymen than ever before. By the end of the 19th century, almost every Christian body from the Orthodox Church of Russia to the Salvation Army, and almost every country from the Lutheran Church of Finland to the Valdensian Church of Italy to the newest denomination of the United States had its share in the missionary work in some foreign country. The, the Baptist Missionary Start Society was one of the first. It started in 1792. It was first called the Particular Baptist Society for the Propagation of the Gospel Amongst the Heathen. In 1795, there started the London Missionary Society. In 1797, the Netherlands Missionary Society. And in 1815, the Basel Missionary Society. I like the seal for the society of propagating the gospel in foreign parts. It showed a ship under sail, making it towards a point of land. And on the very front of the ship was a minister of the gospel with an open Bible in his hand. And the people are standing on the shore in a posture of expectation, using these words in Latin, Come over and help us. It was all part of this modern missionary concern. Uh, William Carey in the Baptist Missionary Society. William Carey was an absolutely groundbreaking man in the history of missions. He thought in terms of evangelizing an entire country and he wanted to see whole populations become Christian. He held that foreign, that foreign missionaries can only begin the work, and the greater and continuing work has to be done by nationals who have come to Jesus Christ. He put an emphasis on developing local ministry. He also saw that Christianity could, in some ways, adapt to the local culture and customs. Uh, William Carey was famous because he was a cobbler. Do you know what a cobbler is? A cobbler is not a shoemaker. He's a shoe repairman, which is even lower than being a shoemaker. He was married to a mentally ill woman. He barely made enough money to keep them both fed, but he was a ravenous learner, and he would rather go without money for food and buy a book if he could. He also had a great thirst for adventure, and his two greatest heroes were Christopher Columbus and Captain James Cook. He was converted by the witness of a fellow shoemaker or cobbler in 1779, and he was baptized in 1783. A few years later, after gaining some preaching experience, he became the pastor of Molten Baptist Church in England. Now again, he's a remarkable example of a missionary leader. You see, towards the end of the 18th century, there was an interest in missions among the people of England. And 12 of the ministers of a certain area called Northamptonshire uh, founded the particular Baptist Missionary Society that I mentioned before. They started it with an initial amount of money, and William Carey was one of the group who had already published a pamphlet urging Christians to do all they could to spread the gospel in a missionary effort. But Carey faced a lot of discouragement. It's said that at a minister's fraternal, which is a gathering of fellow pastors, Carey expressed his zeal for missions, and a great Baptist leader named John Ryland rebuked him by saying this, Young man, 
Sit down. You are an enthusiast. When God pleases to convert the heathen, He will do it without your help or mine. When someone put him down as a simple shoemaker, he protested, I'm not a shoemaker, I'm only a cobbler who repairs shoes. But Carey had a great motto. Carey's motto was, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. It's in. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. He arrived in Calcutta, India in 1793, and he died there in 1834, having spent the entire time in India without a break or furlough. The East India Company would not allow Carey and his associates to work in Calcutta, so they moved 17 miles inland to Serampur, which was under Danish protection. In India at that time, if an infant was sick, the parents simply left the child out in the wild to die and rot or to be eaten by wild animals. Near Malda, Kerry found the remains of a baby that had been offered as a sacrifice to be eaten alive by white ants. At another place, he saw how Indian mothers threw their babies into the sea to be eaten by crocodiles. The Indians regarded this as a holy sacrifice to the mother goddess Ganges. He also worked against the Hindu practice of sati, where the wife of a deceased man would throw herself on the burning funeral pyre of the dead man as a, uh, as a, um, as a way to kill herself. Now combined with polygamy, this was a special horror. Carey documented one time when a man died and all 33 of his wives burned themselves on his funeral pyre. Carey was skilled in languages. He had learned Latin, Hebrew, Greek before he left England. In India, he translated and circulated about 200,000 Bibles or Bible portions in about 40 different in di uh, dialects or sect, uh, languages or dialects behind many, uh, besides many other tracts and Christian books. William Carey was an absolutely groundbreaking Christian missionary. Other notable missionaries to India included Henry Martin and Adoniram Judson. He and his wife, uh, Adoniram Judson and his wife, were the very first American missionaries. Uh, Henry Martin started for India but ended up going to Burma. Excuse me, I'm talking about Adoniram Judson. Um, Judson started out for India but ended up in Burma, and he worked there in Burma for six years before he had a single con convert. He lost his wife to disease and several children to both sickness and disease. Yet by the time Adoniram Judson died, there were over 100,000 baptized Christians among the Karen tribe of <coughs> The 18th century was filled with brave men and women who went out to do great things for God. A great example of this in Africa is David Livingstone. In the middle of the 19th century, the dark continent of Africa began to open up. And again, David Livingstone Scotton was one of the pioneers. He was a medical missionary who gave himself completely to bringing the gospel and civilization to Africa. Livingston came to Africa in 1841, and he served for about 10 years as a typical missionary. But he was driven to leave the medical mission station behind and follow what he called the smoke of a thousand villages that had never seen a missionary. You know, it's remarkable to think that David Livingston lived in Africa. There were different missionary stations scattered around Africa. Most of the missionaries stayed at the missionary station and just did what they could. But Livingston looked across the horizon and he, again, he saw, so to speak, the smoke of a thousand villages. You know, I mean, you can just imagine seeing these trails of smoke going out all around the horizon, marking these different villages where no missionary had ever been. And Livingston said, I want to reach those unreached missionaries. By the way, it might surprise you. It surprised me when I heard it. I don't know why it surprised me. It shouldn't have surprised me, but it did. But it might surprise you to know that there are still hundreds, if not thousands, of villages in Africa that have still never heard the gospel and have never had a Western missionary come and preach to them. Still there today. 
Those opportunities are still wide open today. Anyway, David Livingston had a famous journey that took him from Angola, which is in the middle of Africa, to the west coast of the continent, and then he went back all the way across the continent to the east coast of Africa. On that journey, he showed that he had all the qualities of a great explorer. And one of his great motivations was to heal what he called this open sore of the world, which was the devastating slave trade of Central Africa. He wanted to open up Africa to both Christianity and to trade so that they would have a profitable economy based on something other than the selling of slaves. That was Africa. In China, you had remarkable missionaries like Robert Morrison of Northumberland, who became the chief European expert on Chinese languages and who had translated the entire Bible into Chinese by 1819. After him was William Chalmers Burns, who was another amazing missionary to China from 1846 to 1868. These men and women who worked in China in particular had a tremendous devotion to God and they faced tremendous sacrifices on the mission field. Hudson Taylor's wife died in childbirth at age 33. William Carey buried two wives on the mission field. Adoniram Judson lost two wives to disease. David Livingston buried his wife in Africa. Johann Krapp was a pioneer German missionary to Kenya. He lost both his wife and his children within months of arriving in Africa. In the 19th century, the average life expectancy of a missionary to Africa was eight years. Uh, I don't mean eight years old, but eight years on the field, and by average, they were dead. In the 19th century, in the 1800s. Now, some of the general characteristics of the modern missionary movement can be described as this. First of all, it was voluntary, not compulsory. And this is remarkable, isn't it? All this remarkable missionary effort and all the funding and organization that went on behind it was primarily voluntary and not compulsory, which makes it all the more amazing. It was also without state support or state control, which again is significant. It used the wealth and the talents of everyday Christians. It was not an elitist movement in the slightest. And then also it had a very strong humanitarian impulse. Hospitals, schools, language, agriculture. The idea that the missionary impulse of the 19th century was primarily imperialistic and wanted just to westernize these poor savages and that they wanted to steal their land, it's almost completely false. I won't say it's completely false because there are some examples of this. But for the most part, it was incredibly self-sacrificing, self-giving, and um, with a very strong humanitarian impulse, founding hospitals, schools, languages, and agriculture. You see, in this period as well, Christianity and this missionary impulse had a very strong heart for social reform. In the 19th century, this was expressed in one way through the Clapham sect. You see, England was the cradle of the Industrial Revolution. London soon became the world's largest city and the financial center of the world. British commerce and trade and business circled the globe and the British Navy dominated the seas. This put a tremendous strain on the social institutions of England. And at the beginning of this great century, the 19th century, the evangelical movement, started by Wesley and Whitfield, did an incredible work in turning England towards an increased personal godliness, usually springing from a conversion experience, and then moved them into an aggressive concern for Christian service in the world. Clapham was a village or a community three miles from London where there lived a group of wealthy and influential evangelicals. The unquestioned leader of the Clapham sect was William Wilberforce, a member of Parliament. Wilberforce was an influential statement with an, with an amazing gift of eloquence in public speech. And from Clapham came forth the Society for Bettering the Condition of the Poor, 
the Church Missionary Society, and the British and Foreign Bible Society, as well the great campaign against the slave trade in the British Empire. Have you seen the movie Amazing Grace? Yeah. Raise your hand. Good movie. Pretty historically accurate. You know, I mean, it truly really is a wonderful story about the work of William Wilberforce and his campaign against slavery. Um, Wilberforce made his first great anti-slavery speech in the House of Commons in 1789. Two years later, he introduced a bill against importing any more slaves into the British West Indies. He said this, Never, never will we desist until we've wiped away this scandal from the Christian name, released ourselves from the load of guilt, and extinguished every trace of this bloody traffic. It's very interesting. It's not so much that people wanted slavery in the 19th century. It's more that they simply couldn't conceive of a world without it. They thought that ending slavery was an impractical dream. It would be nice, but it just couldn't be done. And that was the kind of thinking that William Wilberforce and the Clapham sect challenged. So they had an energetic and effective campaign to shape public opinion against the slave trade. Finally, in February of 1807, the House of Commons abolished the slave trade in the British Empire, but the institution of slavery remained. The Emancipation Act was finally passed in July of 1833, four days before William Wilberforce died. The Clapham sect remains a shining example of how a society, perhaps the world itself, can really be influenced by a few dedicated people with a passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The great thing about the Clapham sect was that it was social concern genuinely coupled with an idea to further the gospel. You see, sadly, many people, many Christians, who have an interest in social concern and bettering society, for some reason they seem to abandon their passion for the gospel. Well, this did not happen with the Clapham sect. And they kept very much both a passion for helping people in real social action and um, for furthering the gospel. You know, sometimes you'll hear people criticize the church. They'll say, oh, Christians, they don't do anything for social action. They'll put it into terms of today. They don't do anything for world hunger or for AIDS or for keeping the earth clean or for this or that. I have to say, from a historical perspective, that's a lot of rubbish. It really is. Christians are on the forefront of these things. Christians volunteer their time for social action far, far far more than secular people. It, it's almost unbelievable, the difference. Look, it's not atheists out there doing social action in Christian service. Well, not Christian service, of course not atheists doing Christian service. But I mean social service. And uh, helping the poor. And ministering to the needy. Th those things aren't being done by atheists or secular people. Primarily, it's being done by Christians. Now look, if you want to say that the Christian world always be, needs to be challenged to do more and more, fine. But I think it's completely wrong and inaccurate to say that Christians don't do anything. If you want to say that Christians could do more, great. You can always do more. But the idea that Christians aren't doing anything is just a bald-faced lie. Now another very important thing as this went on was the abolition movement both in Britain and in the United States. Um, against incredible odds, as I said before, William Wilberforce worked to outlaw slavery and the slave trade in the British Empire. And he did it all out of a very deep conviction. If you notice, at the bottom of that engraving, the black man on his knees is pleading and saying, Am I not a man and a brother? That was the simple appeal. That this man is both a human being and a brother. And on that basis, he should not be in chains. Now this opposition to slavery and the slave trade in North America was very strong in the United States prior to the Civil War. Now before 1800, most Christian churches and denominations supported the institution of slavery and tried to promote 
fair and kind treatment of slaves. But at the beginning of the 19th century, public opinion, especially among American Christians, began to grow against slavery. So again, uh, you, you see um, comments being made on both sides of the propaganda war. On the left side, you see a cartoon where a black man is pleading, am I not a man and a brother, and the snooty, you know, rich man turning up his nose at him. On the right side, you see a man, you know, a vicious, wild black man murdering, and this happened, this um, cartoon came after there was an insurrection of black slaves in Jamaica or Haiti. I can't remember which one it was. But nevertheless, the abolitionists were dedicated and unstoppable. Here you see gross caricatures against black people, describing them as being people licentious and the white man who just wants to be there uh, among the licentious black people. The abolitionists were dedicated and unstoppable. They tried to influence public opinion and lawmakers through newspapers such as William Lord Garrison's newspaper, The Liberator. Through speeches and through books, of course, the great book written in the cause of abolition was written by the Christian abolitionist Harriet Beecher Stowe, and the book was Uncle Tom's Cabin. It had a huge influence on bringing people around to an abolitionist mindset. Again, abolitionist means they wanted to abolish slavery, and they opposed slavery on firm Christian principles. Now again, I gotta say, sometimes you hear it today. Sometimes you hear it today saying that Christians or Christianity is responsible for slavery. And that we're responsible for this legacy of slavery, and that you know it's our job as Christians to repent for slavery. Good heavens, I sometimes I can't imagine, and I know this sounds more harsh than I want it to sound, so please forgive me in advance. But sometimes I'm astounded at the ignorance of people who say such things. They act as if Christianity invented slavery. That there wasn't slavery in the world before Bible times. That there wasn't slavery in the world outside of the images. Ladies and gentlemen, slavery was the normal human condition. Every culture had its slaves. Slavery was something tragic, but it was definitely outside of the Bible. It was Christianity that defeated slavery. The impulse for slavery did not come from Christians. The impulse to abolish slavery came from Christians. It didn't come from anybody else. It wasn't the atheists and the secularists who said that we should abolish slavery. It wasn't the Islamists. It wasn't the, the religions of, of the East. It was Christianity and evangelical Christianity at that that provided the impulse to abolish slavery. And so again, the people who act as if there's not a very strong and wonderful social action impulse within Christianity and has been historically, it's just very hard for me to understand that. They seem to have a very, I don't know, biased view of history that wants to make Christians look as bad as possible in history. Maybe so that they can think of themselves as being so wonderful today. I really don't know why. I really don't know why, why people insist on these kind of things. And maybe a large measure of it is just out of simple political correctness. That might be the explanation for a good part. So let me talk about one more thing before we take a look at our gallery of missionaries. Um, talk to you about some uh, images from the temperance movement. The temperance movement were 19th century reform movements that were meant to encourage individuals to either limit or to abstain from the use of alcohol beverages. Now they did this out of great social concern born from Christian convictions. It's very difficult for us to understand what a plague cheap and lethal alcohol was in both Europe and America in the 19th century. You could get enough gin to make yourself absolutely drunk, I mean, just, just passed out in the street. In the 19th century, in a place called Gin Lane or something like that, in the big cities of England or in America, and you could just, for a very cheap price, you could make yourself absolutely blindedly drunk 
And people did this all day long. And the social ramifications of this. Because look, I know that in the modern world people think that about the worst thing somebody can do is smoke cigarettes. I'll tell you this, drunkenness and alcoholism has a far worse social pathology than smoking cigarettes. Because as bad as you might think smoking is, nobody ever went home and beat his wife and his children because he smoked a pack of Marlboros. But because he got drunk, that has happened time and time again. And this social pathology was destroying many, many people, especially the poor, in England and in America. Therefore, a temperance movement came up. The temperance movement was the longest lasting and most broad based social reform movement in the United States. And in many ways, it was successful. In the 19th century, before Prohibition, the drinking habits of Americans were radically changed and they stopped drinking so much alcohol. This was from people like uh, Carrie A. Nation, a temperance activist, who used to go into saloons with a hatchet and just start bashing them up. <laughs> Activists in this movement crossed gender, race, class, religion, and age barriers, and it was very much also connected to the anti-slavery and women's suffrage movements. And again, this idea was that Christians should be concerned with the state of society and that they should try to do things to improve society, this was born out of a genuine Christian impulse. You can see her right there. She's got a Bible in one hand and a hatchet in another. And she's ready to go bust up some saloon that she would walk into. And so the temperance movement tried to show people the disgrace of drunkenness, and it also tried to promote healthy alternatives to alcohol, such as root beer which is a favorite of mine. And on the right, you see an early advertisement for Hires Root. So again, it was the idea of trying to reduce the amount of drunkenness. And I have to say that at least in America, it was remarkably successful. Uh, because the plague of drunkenness was much worse in America at the early part of the 19th century than it was at the end. Now, uh, with the minutes that we have with us uh, remaining in the class, Let's take a look at a gallery of many great missionaries and just say a few words about each one of them. Because most of them, not all of them, served in this great period of the 19th century, this great century. You have Ramon Lowe, who was uh, from the island of Majorca, and he was a missionary to North Africa in the 13th and 14th century. Again, an example of an early and unique missionary. Um, you have Nicholas Ludwig von Zinzendorf, I like what he said. He said, I have but one passion. It is he and he alone. The world is the field and the field is the world. And henceforth that country shall be my home where I can be most used in winning souls for Christ. Um, the Moravians had an amazing impact on modern missionary service. David Brainerd was an amazing American missionary to the American Indians. He said, I have received all mine from God Oh, that I could return my, my all to God. He tragically died young from disease, uh, but he left behind a journal, and the life of David Brainerd and the journals of David Brainerd are well worth your reading. Uh, Alexander McKay was a 19th century Scottish missionary to Uganda. Again, it, it's hard to relate at what a difficult and wild and dangerous place Africa was to go at this time. In the 19th century, when many missionaries went to Africa, they basically didn't take their belongings in a trunk. They built a coffin and put their belongings in the coffin because they figured they were going to be using that as well when they got there. Mm -hmm. It was really a demonstrable thing to put their belongings in a coffin that they built for themselves. Alexander Duff, a famous Scottish missionary to Calcutta, India, Robert Moffat was a 19th century Scottish missionary to South Africa. South Africa was a, time, was a place that was deeply impressed with the gospel in the 19th century. James Calmers, a Scottish missionary to Papua New Guinea and the South Seas. Many of these missionaries to the South Seas had to face and endure um, 
the problem of uh, cannibals on these uh, South Sea islands. Uh, a great example of this is John Patterson uh, to the Melanesia and the Santa Cruz Islands. He says, Jesus our Savior was the first of all Christian missionaries, was 30 years of his life preparing and being prepared for his work. Three years he spake as a man never spake, and did not his work at that time look a failure. He made no mistakes either in what he taught or in the way of teaching, and he succeeded, though not to the eyes of men. Should we not be contented with success like his? And how much less we ought not to be contented. So, the wonder is that by our means, any result is accomplished at all. Because these men often saw very little results in their own day, but they still went on boldly to do the work. James Calvert, a missionary to the Fiji Islands. When James Calvert went out as a missionary to the cannibals of the Fiji Islands, the ship captain tried to turn it back and he said, you will lose your life and the lives with you if you go among such savages. To that, Calvert replied, we died before we came here. You know, I have to say, there's something just very wonderful and might I say manly about the attitude of these missionaries. Willing to endure hardship and lay down their life. And it's something that I think sometimes is lacking from Christian service today. If I could say it without, you know, making it sound weird or sexist, it's sort of a manly spirit. This spirit that says, bring it on. Give me the hard job. Let other people do the difficult work, or do the easy work. I'll do the difficult work. <laughs> well, no, isn't that the attitude today? Let somebody else do the difficult work? But, but the, I think there needs to be an increasing attitude among believers today that says, I'll do the hard work. Give somebody else the easy job. Give me the hard job, because that's what I want to do for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mary Slessor was an amazing missionary to Africa. I find I'm using this adjective amazing a lot in my descriptions. She says, prayer is the greatest power God has put into our hands for service. Praying is harder than doing, at least I find it so, but the dynamic lies in that way to advance the kingdom. Peter Cameron Scott, a Scottish-American missionary to inland Africa in the 19th century. John Patton, a Scottish missionary to the New Hebrides Island near Australia. Oh, what a work he did. His biography is a beautiful, beautiful read. Um, Lilius Trotter was a British missionary to North Africa. She did wonderful, wonderful work as a groundbreaking missionary to North Africa. C.T. Studd was a uh, cricket star. In the world of cricket, he was a world-famous athlete. But he gave it up to become a missionary uh, both to India, China, and to Africa. And uh, again, a, a, a remarkable display of self-sacrifice. I like the saying that he said, Some wish to live within the sound of a chapel bell. I wish to run a rescue mission within a yard of hell. Melvin Fraser, missionary to Cameroon, Africa, in the 19th and 20th centuries. Paget Wilkes did again groundbreaking work as a missionary to Africa, uh, to Japan. He has uh, some great books out. Paget Wilkes, you can remember that name. Barclay Buxton, again to Japan in the 19th and 20th century. Amy Carmichael from Northern Ireland was a great missionary to Japan and South India. Uh, her works are, are very well known. Jonathan Rosalind Goforth, Canadian missionaries in uh, Korea, in Manchuria, China. Amazing works of revival happened under their ministries in both Korea and China. James Fraser, a bitter British missionary to China. He said that solid, lasting missionary work is done on our knees. Eric Liddell, the famous man in the Chariots of Fire movie. He was a uh, groundbreaking Scottish missionary to China in the 20th century. John and Betty Stamp, uh, missionaries to the uh, uh, Chinese in the 20th century. They were martyred by the Red Army in China in 1934. And again, that's all I have up there, but you could keep going on for hours and hours about these tremendous missionaries and the work that they've done. The 19th century truly was the great century in missionary advance 
The missionary movement started somewhat before that, and of course it is extended after that. But we have to say it was a remarkable period of advance for the gospel in the 19th century.